Why don't we begin in prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly King, comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who art ever present, fill us all things, treasure your blessings, and giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls with the Amen. So, welcome back, and thank you to the, the select special few <laughs> that are here. Um, we're going to continue our, our march through, and we're continuing through um, those books of the Bible that we really only find in the Greek uh, and Latin canons, um, as opposed to the Hebrew canon. Um, and so we're going to talk about the, the three books of Maccabees, um, and you'll, you'll see that we're going to actually address them in the order they appear in the Bible, 1st, 2nd, 3rd Maccabees. They're actually out of order historically in that 3rd Maccabees happens before 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Um, we'll, we'll explain that as we go along. <clears throat> um, First Maccabees was written at the end of the second century or the beginning of the first century BC, probably somewhere right around 104 BC. Originally written in Hebrew, but shortly thereafter translated to Greek, pretty, pretty quickly thereafter. Um, and it covers the period when Antiochus IV Epiphanes um, was ruling in the Palestine and Judea area. He's also known as one of the Greek Syrian rulers of that area. So 175 to 164 BC to the beginning of the reign of John Hyrcanus I, 134 to 104 BC, a Jewish ruler. I'll explain who these people are in just a moment where we get there. The books are named after Judah Mac or Judas Maccabeus. Um, Maccabeus uh, is basically a, a transliteration of the word for the hammer in Hebrew. Um, and you'll see as we go through why he receives that name. This is all about him fighting the Greek rulers on behalf of his people. Um, so the historical backdrop, the Persian Empire had become the dominant power in the Near and Middle East under King Cyrus II and his successors. We read about this in First Ezra and Ezra. Ezra. Um, and you can see sort of the extent of the, of the Persian Empire um, you know, was quite large at this point, right? It extends all the way into Egypt, parts of Greece and Asia Minor, and um, what we would also call modern-day Iran, parts of Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, right? I mean, it's a, a massive empire. Um, other notable names that we read about in the Bible during this period include Darius the Great and Xerxes. Um, we, we heard about them in the last few uh, sessions. All right, so the Persian Empire comes in. Cyrus is the one he takes over the Neo-Babylonian Empire, right, who before them had taken over the Assyrian Empire. These are names that we've been hearing about as we've been reading through these various books. Um, then, in approximately 330 BC, Alexander the Great of Macedonia, uh, Macedonia, uh, conquers the Persian Empire. And he uses more than just the sword to keep his empire together. He wisely understands that it's important to use the Greek language and culture to unite the people. And this is when the, the Greek language, which came to be known as the Kini, begins to spread throughout the, the Greek Empire. Kini simply means the common tongue, right? And it was this common form of Greek that spreads throughout the empire and becomes the lingua franca and spreads in the end then not only Greek language, but a lot of the Greek philosophy, the Greek culture, the Greek learning throughout the, the ancient Near East, Northern Africa, and so on. Um, we see the, the full extent of, of his empire, right? It extends all the way from modern day Greece and, um, and parts of even maybe Albania, all the way uh, east through the Asia Minor, the Near East, Egypt, right? All the way through Iran, Afghanistan, and into India. Um, but, uh, Ultimately, Alexander dies very young in 323. Um, you know, he's only, I think, 32 years old or something like this. 
um, you know, just before he was planning to march into India further and wanted to go all the way into the Indus Valley and begin to conquer the Indian uh, culture there on the subcontinent. And he ends up dying um, and, and is not able to continue his, uh, his plans. But you see, it's this massive empire. And again, that Greek language and that Greek culture is starting to spread throughout that entire time period. But when he dies, he's awfully young, and he had never given any thought to how do you sustain an empire of this sort? How do you deal with succession, most importantly, right? Because he never thought as a young man in his early 30s that he'd have to figure out who his successor was going to be yet. It's like, I'll get done conquering, and then we'll figure all that out. But that's not how it worked. So upon his death, the empire ends up getting split up by his generals into five sections. And his generals kind of all take over and establish their own, essentially, kingdoms in, in these areas. In time, their successors would also um, take over those particular kingdoms. And Antiochus Epiphanes was the Greek general who rules Palestine and Judea out of Syria. Um, he reigns from about 175 to 164 BC. He was fanatical about Hellenizing the Jews. He wanted them to adopt that culture, adopt their religion, adopt their language, adopt everything about um, Hellenic lifestyle. So he built gymnasiums, um, which were the primary source of education in the Greek culture at the time. I mean, it's interesting to note uh, they put an incredible focus on physical education, um, you know, exercise, athletics, and competitions. Um, it's, uh, you know, it comes from, this comes from the word gymnos in ancient Greek, which means naked, okay? Because you would compete naked, and so the schools were literally called like, you know, naked places, <laughs> right? Um, but, um, but the point of it is that um, all of these athletic competitions were a big deal. But it wasn't just about exercising. It wasn't just about, um, you know, getting a sweat on or teaching kids sportsmanship like we do with soccer or whatever else. It also had a religious component to it. Every academy, every gymnasium had its own sponsoring god, often Hermes or one of the others. Um, there were you know, offerings made to the idols of the god who sponsored the gymnasium before any of the competitions. And all of the competitions were said to be done in honor of that particular god. And so to go to the gymnasium was to effectively adopt pagan religion. And what's important to note, it wasn't just Antiochus who was building these gymnasiums, he supported it, but it was the Jews in Jerusalem who were building the gymnasiums as part of their own will, wanting to be with the in crowd, with what was cool and what was um, in vogue philosophically, culturally, etc., educationally within, within the, the um, time. So they were doing it to themselves and they stopped circumcising the children. But he ends up then going so far as to profane the temple. He strips it of everything that's there um, you know, tears down the things that were there, forbids proper sacrifice, insists that, for example, pigs be offered on the altar there in the temple, and various other, um, you know, Im impure, profane, unclean sacrifices, as, and then installs various idols there and profanes the temple across the board. If a woman was found to have circumcised her son, he would kill the mother and hang the infants from their mother's necks. Okay. He was trying to stamp out the Jewish faith and trying to insist on the adoption of pagan culture. But the point here is that, yes, he was brutal in doing it, but a lot of the folks who were there were adopting it themselves and building these gymnasiums and wrestling arenas and all of these other things themselves in order to fit in. It also, I think, just to underscore, um, when there is exercise rooted in a particular pagan religion, to say that you are stripping that exercise of the religious context 
is, um, uh, what's the right word I want to use? Um, impossible. <laughs> okay. And um, uh, we see that with a lot of the movements and exercises that we see coming over, especially from the Far East, that are very in vogue today. And I'll leave my commentary at that. Um, but, but to say that you are going to practice the religious exercises and strip it of the religious content, the Greeks understood even before Christianity that there was no such thing as stripping the physical from the spiritual, the emotional, and the mental. We are one person, and it is all united together. Um, it's against this backdrop that Mattathias ben Johanan, or son of John, steps forward. He's a Jewish priest who fled Jerusalem and its apostasy to go to the city of Modin, not far away, with his five sons. He and all of the people of Modin were then ordered to offer unlawful sacrifice. Okay, the, the forces of Antiochus come. Mattathias refuses. When another Jewish man went forward to offer sacrifice, Mattathias, in his zeal, slays him right there on the pagan altar. He says, you will not offer this unclean sacrifice here in this city. This ends up sparking a revolt and a gathering of an army to fight off the Greeks. Basically, Mattathias and his sons begin this revolt against the Greek forces and their, and their tyranny. Okay. Um, one of his sons in particular was named Judas, or Judah Maccabeus. Um, as I said at the beginning, Maccabeus is a nickname It means the hammer. Okay? He was an incredible leader of his people, and uh, he begins to be nicknamed the hammer. <clears throat> he leads a revolt against Antiochus, which ends up leading to Antiochus' defeat. He then fights off multiple successors, and we read about it in both 1st and 2nd Maccabees. He ends up fighting off multiple successors to Antiochus, to try and restore freedom of worship and culture uh, and, and life for the Jewish people um, from the Greeks. Eventually, he forms treaties with Rome and Sparta to aid in Israel's defense so that they would help keep the Greeks away from them. I will just note, um, there's a whole lot of history, but the identification of the people that we would call today Greek with the title Greek is actually rather modern. If you went back 300 years ago, they would have called themselves Romei, not Greek. They were Romans. Okay? Um, and in fact, in much of the writings of the fathers and certainly everywhere in the scripture, Greek is not a nice name. Okay? It means pagan. And especially in these books, it's not conveyed very nicely. So it's an interesting historical thing of how did the people who were the successors of the Roman Empire end up starting to identify as being Greek instead of Roman. It's a fascinating um, modern history and anthropology, sociology discussion. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things though that happens is as they fight off Antiochus's forces, uh, Judas Maccabeus and his brothers, which came to be known as the Hasmonean dynasty, um, they recover the temple and restore it to proper worship. And over the period of eight days, the temple was rededicated. According to the Babylonian Talmud, there was actually only one vial of undefiled oil left in the temple when they discovered it again. And for eight days, they burned the seven candle uh, lampstand, the menorah, within the temple, without one vial of oil and it never ran out and it continued to burn throughout those eight days. Um, this would eventually come to be known as the, the memory of this becomes to be known as the festival of lights or simply the dedication, which we know as Hanukkah. So it's actually interesting, right, that the Catholics and Orthodox have the book of, have the uh, basis for the Feast of Hanukkah in our Bibles and Modern-day Jews do not, even though they follow the, the, the feast day. It's actually in our Bibles. Um, and um, 
as we'll talk about later, it's actually not uncommon to see seven branched candle stands, even in Orthodox altars to this day, as a hearkening back to um, the, the Jewish temple. Um, <clears throat> what we see over and over again in 1 Maccabees and really in all of the books of Maccabees is the courage of the martyrs, resistance to evil and apostasy while remaining faithful to God. Um, Metropolitan Augustino summarizes Judas Maccabeus' declaration, even if everyone falls down and worships the idols, I will remain faithful to the religion of my fathers. Right. Against all oppression, against all resistance, I will worship God. I will not abandon the faith of my fathers. We have this, the wonderful Politikion, the hymn for martyrs in our church. Thy martyr, O Lord, in his courageous contest for thee, received as the prize the crowns of incorruption and life from thee, our immortal God. For since he possessed thy strength, he cast down the tyrants and wholly destroyed the demon's strengthless presumption. Right? Our martyrs are victorious. They are victorious champions like Judas Maccabeus. Um, we, in fact, have martyric faith. This is the, the, uh, a picture from the dedication, the consecration of St. Nicholas Shrine this past July at Ground Zero. And what we see is our special of the photos here placing the relics of St. Nicholas and other martyrs um, into the very altar there at the church. And it will be then, it, it's then sealed in. Uh, this is wax, yes, here, that will then be poured around to seal the relics of the martyrs into the altar. We know that from very, very early on, the liturgy was celebrated on the relics of the martyrs and the tombs of the holy martyrs. I mean, it comes from the book of Revelation itself, Revelation 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony, martyria, right, which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Even in heaven, what's under the altar? The martyrs. Our worship on earth corresponds to the worship in heaven. And so the souls of the martyrs are under the altar in heaven, and their physical remains are here in the altar in the churches on earth. Um, the early church writer Tertullian wrote in, in Latin um, this phrase that, that essentially translates to, we multiply, he was writing to the Romans, we multiply when you reap us. Right? The blood of Christians is seed. Sometimes gets translated, paraphrased, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You may have heard that phrase, right? But I actually love the pithiness of the way he actually wrote it, right? We multiply when you reap us, the blood of Christians is seed. Right? Because we follow Christ. He said that if they persecuted him, they would persecute us. Right? I'll never forget one of the most challenging homilies I heard as a teenager um, was a, a Roman Catholic priest from Colombia preaching in my, my church I grew up in. He said, if you are not being persecuted for your faith, you aren't living it. He was that blunt. If you are not being persecuted for your faith, you are not living it. And being persecuted does not mean somebody at the checkout aisle saying happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. Right. If that's your definition of being a martyr and being persecuted for the faith, we've got a lot to learn from Judas Maccabeus and his brothers. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to Second Maccabees. Any questions on, on where we are right now? So Judas was killed. Was Judas was not killed. Okay. Judas Maccabeus was not He's killed. He's considered a martyr. No, not really. He was a, a righteous high priest in the end and ruler. Um, but, um, you know, there were plenty of other martyrs around him 
at the time. And we're, we're gonna get to some more in just a moment. Um, but, uh, but no, but he showed the willingness, right? He stood up and was willing to lay his life down on the line for, for his faith and for his people. Um, you know, sometimes, for example, in the Orthodox Church, we have what we call confessors. Those people who were willing to die for the faith, who were persecuted for the faith, but God preserved from actually dying, right? And we still recognize them as being close enough, so to speak, right? This past Sunday, we have celebrated St. Paul, the confessor of Constantinople, persecuted for his faith, but ended up not actually being physically killed on the spot for his faith. Um, St. John the Apostle is another example, right? Went through incredible tortures throughout his life, but ended up dying in peace. We still recognize him as effectively having a martyr's crown. Um, um, <clears throat> all right, so 2 Maccabees is a work then, it's based, and it says this very clearly even in the text of the, the book, but it's based on a five-volume history written by a man named Jason of Cyrene, um, written somewhere around 124 BC or a little bit later. We don't have the five-volume work by Jason of Cyrene, um, but this is sort of a, a synopsis and summary of that five-volume work, okay? Um, it, it relates additional events concerning Judas Maccabeus and his family and their fight uh, for the freedom and protection of their people. This book, uh, you know, unlike 1 Maccabees, which was written in Hebrew, 2 Maccabees appears to have been written in Greek. There's no indication from the text that it was being translated into Greek from another language. Um, it begins with letters encouraging the Jews in Egypt to celebrate the Feast of Hanukkah, to celebrate in their own way and in their own place the Feast of the Rededication of the Temple. So we see very, very early on that the rededication of the temple begins to be celebrated by Jews, not only in Jerusalem, but even in the diaspora uh, as a celebration. It goes into a great detail regarding how the rededication of the temple was celebrated the first time by the, the Maccabeans. And so there's several chapters where it talks about how the temple was rededicated, how they prayed, um, and it's worth, it's worth reading. It gives another insight into how Jews worshiped during this period, you know, only you know, less than 200 years before Christ, right? Which is part of the, the beauty and the importance of these books from the Greek canon is that there, otherwise there's a several hundred year period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But these additional books um, come from that period, what, what you'll sometimes hear scholars refer to as the intertestamental period. In fact, if you have the fuller Greek canon, there isn't really much of a gap at all. And it gives better insight into how did the Jews in the time period leading up to Christ believe, worship, pray, and live. And it gives better insight then into um, how the Christians in the early church understood the faith and hearkened back to it. This book is focused much more on the correct theology, belief, and practice of the Maccabeans rather than just the military exploits. Okay, so it's gonna go into a little bit more of the theology of all of this. And this is what I was mentioning, by the way. You see seven branch candle stands, um, even in a lot of Orthodox altars to this day. Um, in fact, in a lot of Slavic churches, they're pretty adamant about it. It has to be there effectively. <clears throat> um, so we read in 2 Maccabees about the Maccabean martyrs in particular. <clears throat> the seven sons, Abim, Antonios, Urias, Eleazar, Sabonis, Alimos, and Marcellos, their mother, uh, Solomonia, and their teacher, Eleazar, who suffered about the year 166 before Christ. Okay. We commemorate them every year on August 1st. Um, and it's an incredible story, in fact, in, in 2 Maccabees, um, where Antiochus is trying to get 
Eleazar and Solomonia um, to or Salome to um, reject the faith to you know eat uh, uh, pig basically and and reject their faith and so he begins by creating this giant frying pan quite literally and threatens if you don't give up the faith I'm throwing your son in and he stands up and defends his faith she encourages him he's thrown into the frying pan right in front of her and she watched she and the other boys have to watch him fry to death in front of them Antiochus then goes one by one through each of her sons and tortures them in front of her face, in front of her eyes. Each son seeing what's happening to his brother and what's probably coming for him. And each time she encourages them and says, do not give up your faith. Praise God, pray to him. Do not neglect your faith. Eleazar as well, their teacher, encourages them and strengthens them through prayer. And in the end, each and every single one of them dies. And she never abandons her faith. Um, you know, now that you're asking me that question, I don't remember. Let me, let's check. It's like a place like here. Um, exactly, exactly. Um, what, um, as I'm looking that up, Carol, because that is a good question. Um, the, is it chapter seven? Yeah. So Eleazar is killed. Um, and in the end, I mean, here, here's, by the way, one of, one of her exhortations to her son. My son, have mercy on me. I carried you for nine months in my womb and nursed you for three years. I reared you and brought you up to this point in your life and have taken care of you. I beseech you, my child, to look at heaven and earth and see everything in them and know that God made them out of nothing. So also he made the race of man in this way. Do not fear this executioner, but be worthy of your brothers and accept death, that in God's mercy I may receive you back again with your brothers. That is true motherhood. Yeah. Not go be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. Make us proud. Not, yeah, go make us proud, right? Be successful, keep up with the Joneses. No. Um, be worthy of your brothers and accept death, and in God's mercy I may receive you back again with your brothers. Right? Um, last of all, the mother died after her sons. So yes, in the so end, after same having thing to same thing to her. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, what faith, right? What an example of Christian motherhood. Um, the hymn that we have, let us praise the seven Maccabees with their mother Salome and their teacher Eleazar. They were splendid in lawful contest as guardians of the teachings of the law. Now as Christ's holy martyrs, they ceaselessly intercede for the world. Um, it also becomes, their martyrdom becomes the basis for a book called Fourth Maccabees. It is not included in the Orthodox Study Bible or, or in the Greek canon, but is often included as an appendix in a lot of Orthodox Old Testaments, especially in the Slavonic canon. So in Russian churches, they include Fourth Maccabees as, a, um, as an appendix. And it's, it's, it's good to read. This is, a, um, this is a New Oxford Annotated Bible with Apocrypha, Survived Standard Version, and it has a fuller set of the Apocrypha that in, or the Deuterocanonical books that includes the Fourth Book of Maccabees. And basically, it's an extended um, set of homilies and discussions, it, it, each of the boys gives an extended um, defense of his faith and a prayer to God. And it ends up being, you know, I think it's 17 chapters of, or 18 chapters, that is the discussion of what we can learn from their martyrdom. And ultimately, the, the largest point of it all is that um, our reason should control our emotions, right? That we should keep our emotions in check and always aim towards the higher good, which we see through, through, the, um, through the Maccabean martyrs. Um, it's, a, it's a powerfully vivid story, and I would encourage everyone to, to read it. 
we also see the prayers for the fallen soldiers. So there's a battle at one point, and after the battle, Judas goes to bury the fallen Jewish soldiers, and he finds that they're wearing around their neck the sacred tokens of the Jamnian idols. In other words, they're wearing pagan symbols. Okay. Um, don't get me started on why no Orthodox Christian should wear the mati. It's a pagan symbol. Um, but uh, he, it, the, it relates then, they turn to prayer, beseeching that the sin which had been committed might be wholly blotted out for the already departed soldiers. Right? And the noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened because of the sin of those who had fallen. He also took up a collection man by man to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver, sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that, those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore he made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. It was a powerful statement of prayer for the departed, right? and that it existed already in the Jewish faith before Christ even came. Now, for those of us who, who are Orthodox and have been Orthodox all our life, this may feel like a, well, of course, but, you know, to our Protestant brothers and sisters and to most Jews today, this is shocking stuff. They reject this utterly. Calvin, for example, John Calvin, hated this book of the Bible for this reason, right? But whether you accept this book as being appropriate for showing doctrine, the point is, this was clearly Jewish practice already then and exhorted and, and, and praised, right, and, and cherished because this is one of the great heroes of the Jewish faith at this time, Judas Maccabeus. And when he finds that these people have sinned, he prays for them, he offers sin offerings for them, right, sacrifices for them, takes up alms for them, specifically because of the faith in the resurrection, right? And this is exactly the Orthodox faith still to this day. Um, St. Nectarios, who we celebrate today, describes it this way. The partial judgment to which all men are subjected after death is by no means complete and final. Wherefore, it naturally follows that they await another complete and final judgment. During the partial judgment, only the soul of man receives its retribution, not the body as well even though the latter shared with the soul its deeds, good or evil. After the partial judgment, the righteous in heaven and the sinners in Hades have only a foretaste of the blessedness or punishments which they deserve. Finally, after this partial judgment, some of the sinners will be relieved of the burden of the punishment and will be completely delivered from the sufferings of Hades, not through their own action, but through the prayers of the church. We can't repent anymore after death but we can benefit from the prayers of those who remember us. Right? Um, I won't get into an extended discussion of this, but St. John Damascene, for example, has a, a very important discussion of why it is we can't repent after death, and it has to do with the fact that we don't have bodies anymore. We aren't changeable anymore. Um, but until the time of the general resurrection, when our bodies are raised and our souls and bodies are reunited, we can still continue to benefit from the prayers of those who are on earth, the prayers of the church on our behalf. Wonderful story of the St. Gregory the Dialli and St. Gregory the Great. He says, in the time of St. Benedict, there were two women who excelled in fasting, but although they had a reputation for the holiness of their lives, they had an unfortunate passion for talking and used to say much that was untrue and harmful. The saint begged them to restrain their tongues and when they disobeyed, he even threatened to excommunicate them. But their passion for lies and, uh, and you know, gossiping had taken so deep a root that even threats did not stop them. A few days later, they died. These fasters were buried in a church. When, during the liturgy, the deacon would say, catechumens depart, they, since they had been excommunicated, would get out of their tombs and go out of the church. 
Some pious Christians saw them doing this. When the man of God had been told of this, he sent to Prospera, altar bread, right, and Pedro to the church where the women had been buried, and ordered that a part of the bread be taken out for their souls, like we still do to this day, right? We offer the Prospera, and the priest takes particles out to commemorate specific people living and departed. After this, no one saw them again leaving the church, and the faithful understood that their prayers for the dead women were pleasing to the merciful God, who then forgave them. Right? So how powerful it is to commemorate the faithful in, in the uh, proscomy V, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and we should take advantage of that as often as we can. At the same time in 2 Maccabees, we see the opposite being true as well. The saints praying for us. On his way to a battle, Judas, Maccabeus, has a vision. Okay? What he saw was this. Onias, who had been high priest, a noble and good man of modest bearing and gentle manner, one who spoke fittingly and had been trained from childhood in all that belongs to excellence, was praying with outstretched hands for the whole body of the Jews. Onias was dead. We've already read that in the, earlier in the book. Onias was dead. But he has a vision of Onias standing there with his hands upraised, praying for all of the Jewish people. Right. Then likewise a man appeared, distinguished by his gray hair and dignity, and of a marvelous majesty and authority. And Onias spoke, saying, This is a man who loves the brethren and prays much for the people and the holy city, Jeremiah the prophet of God, who has been dead hundreds of years. Jeremiah stretched out his right hand and gave to Judas a golden sword, and as he gave it, he addressed him thus, Take this holy sword, a gift from God, with which you will strike down your adversaries. So the Jews clearly understood that the holy people, of the, the, the righteous ones, including the holy prophets, prayed for the people of, of uh, the Jewish faith. Right? It was both ways. You could pray for those who had departed unrighteously, and in return, as well, the righteous people prayed for us. Um, notice, by the way, this shows up in the gospel, and we miss it every time. On the cross, what does Christ say, right? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, right? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And it says that some of the people there thought he was crying out to Elijah. Stop for a minute. That's like a, it should be a record scratch. For anyone who thinks that it would be inappropriate to pray to the saints, right? Because it was clearly such an established Jewish practice to seek the intercession of the prophets that when they hear Christ on the cross saying, Eli, Eli, they think he's crying out to Elijah. Right? Nobody says, and they thought therefore he was blaspheming or something like this, right? They just assumed, I mean, you're pretty tough tough spot, you're calling out to Elijah, right? And we sort of read that and skip over that and don't ever stop to think about, wait a minute, the Jews thought it was okay to call out to the prophets. Why? Well, because not that long before, Judas Maccabeus actually had a vision of Jeremiah praying for them, and this holy priest Onias, right? This was a normal feature of the Jewish faith that continues right into the Christian faith from, from there without interruption. Um, does that make sense? I mean, it, it, this should be, I mean, this is, this is powerful realization, right? Because we don't think of um, it being a feature of the Jewish faith to pray for the departed and to seek the intercession of holy people. But it was. Uh, we think of it as being a uniquely, like, Orthodox and Catholic thing, right? But it's not. We got it from the Jews because it's the same faith. Also, the uh, story of Anesiphor with uh, Paul in mm -hmm. uh, saying, pray for him, and it's implied that he's dead, and they're saying, pray for him and his family. Right. Um, and that's kind of also glossed over a lot, but I think, like you're saying, it's, it's, it could almost be, because it's so common, it doesn't need to be extrapolated or explained here. You know, it's like, they're already doing this. They were just doing it. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're right. In, in um, I forget which of the epistles, but Paul... Second Thessalonians or something. Anyway, you know, at the end of a lot of St. Paul's epistles, he's saying, you know, greet this person, say hello to this person, bring my cloak back, you know, all these kind of the more personal aspects of the letter. 
And in one of them, he says, pray for my, my friend Onesimus. And it is implied in the way that he's describing it that Onesimus was in fact dead already, right? Um, now it's not so crystal clear that we can say, see, you know, but we don't have to. That's not the way that orthodox apologetics should work. But, but it would not be surprising if that's the case, given that that was already an established Jewish practice. Um, all right. And then finally, 3rd Maccabees um, is written in Greek in the early 1st century BC. Now, this book, um, like I said, is a little bit out of order in a sense chronologically. It doesn't actually deal with the Maccabeans, okay? It, it occurs before the previous two books, during the reign of Ptolemy IV Philopater in Alexandria, Egypt, about the years 221 to 203 BC. So it was a few decades before the events of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Okay? Now you can say, why then would they even give the name Maccabees to this? Right? And the reason is that because the example of Judas Maccabeus and his brothers was so powerful, of this is what a person who witnesses their faith and stands up to oppression to fight on behalf of the Jewish faith is like, that that name then gets attached to the people that we read about in this book who do something similar with the, the Greek ruler, actually the Greek pharaoh in, in Egypt, okay? So Ptolemy IV, uh, Philopater, was another one of these descendants of Alexander's generals who ruled in the area of Egypt, okay, uh, uh, based out of Alexandria, but he also called himself a pharaoh, right? He was the ruler of Egypt, and he was both a Greek king, general, whatever they call themselves, Greek ruler, but he was also pharaoh, okay? Um, Ptolemy decides, because there's a large Jewish population in Alexandria, this is why we have the Septuagint, right? Or the Greek Old Testament is these Greek-speaking Jews in Alexandria. Ptolemy decides he wants to visit Jerusalem and visit the temple. And he gets there and he's struck by the outer beauty. Sorry, there's a typo. He's struck by the outer, outer beauty of the temple and decides he wants to go in and see. If it's this beautiful, clearly inside must be even more beautiful. I'm going into the Holy of Holies. Okay. The priests explain why he can't do that. And he doesn't care. So the high priest Simon and the other priests, fully vested, fall down on the ground and begin praying out loud, very loudly and crying out, um, asking God that he stop Ptolemy from this profanation. All right. The whole rest of the people then begin doing, praying as well and begging God to stop Ptolemy from being able to do this. And all of a sudden it says Ptolemy is Duck. He can't move and begins to shake. And he can't even speak, right? He's so overcome in that moment by the power of God. <clears throat> and he ends up not being able to enter into the temple at all. He returns to Egypt and he's so upset. He's so sick of the, the Jews. He's embarrassed by his inability to get into the temple. So he orders that all of the Jews in Alexandria be gathered up and placed into the Colosseum. Okay. Soldiers gather 500 elephants, these war elephants that were in common usage in Greek and Roman times. They then get them drunk so that they would stampede the Jews in a frenzy. Okay. And yeah, get the elephants drunk and send them to just go and kill the tens of thousands of Jews that were there. The elderly priest Eleazar led the Jews in prayers. By the way, are you noticing Eleazar is a very common name, especially among the priestly people? It then later in time, among especially Greek speaking Jews, begins to be called Lazarus. Okay, it's the same name as Lazarus. Um, God sends two angels to attack Ptolemy's forces. Ptolemy is mute in horror. He's standing there once again, not able to speak. As he sees the angels go down, kill some of the soldiers, and then turn the elephants towards the soldiers. Okay. The war elephants go and turn on the soldiers and kill all of the, the Greek soldiers there and leave the Jews safe. All right. Um, 
It's an incredible, incredible story of God's protection for his people, right? And, um, you know, it, it remind, reminded me of how we celebrated um, in October. October 1st, for most of the world, in the Greek-speaking world of modern times, October 28th, as we spoke about in our last session, is the holy protection of the Mother of God. And there are so many different events in the history of the church, and especially in the history of Constantinople of the city being besieged, of it being under attack, of the people being in danger, and the Mother of God protecting them. Um, in particular, uh, you know, there's a time in the, I think it's the, the 10th century, maybe, where um, Constantinople was threatened by pagan Russians, the, the Rus, and they're under great threat, the whole city, and um, St. Andrew, I believe, the fool for Christ, sees in the church of Laferne, the mother of God with her protection stretched out over the people. And that's what we celebrate on, on holy protection. And you'll notice in most of the icons of holy protection, you also see this deacon under here with a scroll that St. Romanos the Melodist, having written the Agathus to the mother of God for another time centuries before when she protected the city of Constantinople against invasion, right? So they kind of bring all these events together into one um, icon. It's especially ironic and beautiful that it's actually one of the most beloved feasts of the Mother of God in Russia now, um, even though it's celebrating Constantinople's deliverance from their ancestors uh, before they had accepted uh, uh, Christ. Um, or at least that, that part of uh, the Russians that accepted Christ. And so, this protection that we see in thir Third Maccabees of God for his people when they stand up for, um, for their faith in Christ has continued um, throughout all of the centuries to the present. Uh, and there are many stories, even in World War II, for example, of um, the you know, Greek soldiers in various places being protected by the Mother of God against uh, the enemies, uh, and, and many, other, many other stories throughout church history. Um, so that's the end of Third Maccabees um, and our discussion of it. Uh, for those who are keeping track, um, next time we'll be, you know, we're kind of through the, the, um, a lot of the books that are from the Greek canon. There's a few more that we're going to get to a little bit further on in, in the wisdom literature in particular. Next time, though, we get to the book of Psalms, and um, I'm not going to try and combine the book of Psalms with another book. <laughs> We're going to just talk the book of Psalms, um, because it, it stands on its own and warrants that discussion. Um, I'll just make a plug for the Psalter group that we're resuming next week during uh, Nativity Fast. It'll be a perfect time for us to be talking about the Psalms then. Um, we're not going to meet uh, in two weeks because that's the night before Thanksgiving. We'll meet the following Wednesday, the last Wednesday of the month. Um, since I don't plan to be here the night before Thanksgiving and I suspect none of you do either. So with that, I'll go ahead and um, why don't we, maybe we can finish the prayer for me. Yeah. Since I'm not on camera, I think I can. All right. <laughs> In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for guiding us by your Holy Spirit. Through your servant, Justin the Deacon, into a knowledge of understanding and greater wisdom in your Holy Scriptures. May we seek to dive deep into their meanings, in their lessons, and in their readings that we may grow in stature and wisdom and always glorify you in every act and thought of our life. For you only bound to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Of course.